Hi, and welcome to my presentation for the Granular Sea Ice Workshop. Uh, thank you to the organizers for having me. My talk is called Flow Scale Ridging in Discrete Element Models for Sea Ice. And while I'm presently located at Aarhus University in Denmark, um, this work is mainly based off my time spent at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab at Princeton University, in collaboration with Olga Sajenko and Alistair Adcroft. CS ridging is an important process as soon as we have compression or shear. And for the Arctic ice pack, compression and shear in particular happens against the northern coasts of Canada and Greenland, where the large-scale atmospheric patterns uh, move ice against these land boundaries. The ridging process acts to increase the ice thickness and as soon as we have a thick ice pack, the ice pack proves to be resilient during summer melting events. So thick ice is resilient ice. The pressure ridging itself happens primarily at the boundaries between individual ice flows, where the ice breaks into a chaotic rubble, such as seen in this picture. This increases the thickness both upwards but also primarily downwards into the water column. Refreezing can then join the chaotic ice pieces together in a stronger ice pack. Traditional continuum sea ice models are based on the assumption that every cell consists of many, many ice flows. However, the resolution of climate models is increasing and as such the continuum assumption comes into question as the individual cell sizes become smaller and smaller and approaches the size of individual ice flows. For that reason, there are many initiatives now to investigate the potential of granular dynamics methods to simulate sea ice in coupled climate models. With regards to ridging, um, there are many established models that are based on the idea that the strength of ice increases with the thickness of ice. That is something that we want to test in this study. So in order to do that, we analyze the mechanical interaction of two simulated ice flows during compression. We take the observed behavior during this compression experiment and generalize it into a simple set of equations that we can put into a larger scale particle-based sea ice model. We use this ridging model to then explore the effects on the larger scale of ridging with regards to the bulk rheology and the strain distribution. First off, I would like to speak a little bit about the discrete element method. When wanting to deploy the discrete element method, the first task is to choose your model dimensionality. While three-dimensional modeling gives the most complete picture, uh, for sea ice models, it's often reasonable to reduce the problems into two dimensions, where the two-dimensional plane is the ocean surface. In that case, you disregard any vertical movement within that setting. Next off, you need to implement some way that the particles are detecting mutual contacts. So with a given particle shape, such as circles, in this example, it is quite easy to detect if two particles are in contact. You simply need to figure out their center positions and their radii, and from that you can figure out if they are actively overlapping or not. The simplest contact detection method is the all-to-all -all contact search. Unfortunately, it's also the most computationally expensive because it's an order of n squared operation. Instead, you can make a list of potential contacts by searching within the neighborhood and keeping a list of close by contacts. Finally, you can discretize your model domain into a number of cells, and when searching for contacts, you can choose to only look in the neighboring cells. Common for all of these contact search methods is that if there is a large range of different flow sizes, then the contact search becomes very expensive 
On the other hand, if the particles are close to being monodisperse, that means of equal size, then the contact search is much faster. In this example and in the modeling that I'll show here, um, everything is based off circles and, and cylindrical particles. It is of course also possible to simulate more complex shapes such as triangles or higher order polyhedra. However, computational cost is often a limiting factor in discrete element modeling. So um, for many reasons, I will stay with the simple shape here. The next task is to transfer information between your ocean and atmosphere grids and the discrete Lagrangian ice particles. Depending on what kind of um, grid you have within the ocean and atmosphere, um, you need to interpolate the nodes uh, on the cells onto the ice flows. For stability reasons, most models are using a staggered grid where different velocity components are placed on different sides of the, the model cells. So what we use is a bilinear interpolation scheme to transfer information from the ocean grid onto the ice particles. The next step is to figure out the contact mechanics between individual particles. The contact interface is typically discretized into force components in the normal direction, along the line between the centers of mass of the ice particles, and in the tangential direction, transverse and parallel to the contact plane. For the normal force, um, the elastic repulsion typically starts as soon as the individual particles overlap. And this is what is called the soft body discrete element method. The repulsive force can be linear with increasing overlap distance, such as shown here, or it can be nonlinear if we base it on some kind of Hertzian, Hertz Mendelian contact mechanics. But the linear mechanics are the simplest case because then the stiffness within the system is constant and we can use a constant time step for stability purposes. For the tangential movement, the grinding of ice flows against each other, we can use similar elastic mechanics. So by measuring and keeping track of the contact travel distance between a pair of particles, we can impose a tangential force, Ft, with opposite signs to the participating ice flows. However, this tangential stress and force cannot grow to, uh, without any upper bounds. So for that reason, we usually um, uh, limit the tangential force by a Coulomb frictional coefficient called mu here. This means that the tangential force scales linearly with the magnitude of the normal force, such as known from high school frictional slider experiments. The contact rheology in discrete element methods typically consists of multiple components, not just elasticity and friction, such as in the previous examples. It's common practice to introduce viscous dampers in parallel to the elastic components in what is called a kelvin void rheology. And this would typically be the case both for the normal force and for the tangential force. The role of these viscous dampers in traditional uh, discrete element models is to dissipate energy, so act as energy sinks. In my experience, this is typically not necessarily when simulating sea ice, because drag against the ocean and atmosphere typically adds a lot of dampening to the system already. And if you do an analysis of the characteristic deformation time scale, what is called the maximal time, then it turns out that viscous is neglectable on the timescales relevant for uh, CI's deformation. So 
My recommendation is to use elasticity and friction alone for the purposes of ice contact mechanics. That's for unbonded uh, interactions. Things become more complex if we want to bond individual particles of ice together to form a larger aggregate. There are several degrees of freedom that the bonds between particles need to resist. The first are extension and compression. Even though the particles are not directly overlapping anymore, they should still want to be sticking together. The particle-particle bonds should also have a resistance against shear and a resistance against bending. All of these um, different bond deformation modes can be uh, approximated by taking solutions for beam mechanics into consideration. So in, in some ways the ice particles are bonded together by beams of ice that are uh, bendable in an elastic sense and breakable uh, as soon as any kind of internal stresses exceed the compressive or shear strength of the ice material. If you go full 3D, such as Agnieszka Hermann, you also need to take torsion into consideration. So if two ice flows um, that are bonded together are floating on the ocean surface, then you need to resist the twisting motion if they move in a twisting motion to each other. So this torsion adds another level of complexity if you add the third dimension into your modeling. For the simulations that I'm going to show here, I've written my own uh, discrete element model called granular.jl, which is a package for the language Julia. It can read in NetCDF files um, with uh, information of atmosphere and ocean states. It should be thought of as a sandbox for toying around with different concepts around discrete element modeling, so it has an emphasis on flexibility over performance. However, at present I'm rewriting the code into the C language, so it'll be um, more uh, high efficient with regards to computational time, and it, it'll also be easier to port to high performance computation environments, which would typically run in uh, Fortran or C already. In our ridging experiments, we have the following simulation setup. First of all, the simulation domain is seen from the side. So the magenta line here represents the static ocean surface. We see that in this case, there are two ice flows floating on the ocean surface and the bonds between the individual ice particles uh, are visualized with pipes in this image. So each ice flow consists of many individual ice particles and the ice particles are bonded together with the aforementioned breakable elastic bonds. With regards to boundary condition, the leftmost part of this uh, ice flow is prescribed to move with a horizontal velocity towards the right, but it is free to move up and down with regards to buoyance adjustment. Um, by contribution or flotation from, from the ocean. The right-hand side of the rightmost ice flow is similarly uh, prescribed to be uh, static in a horizontal sense. So it's not allowed to move uh, left or right, but it can move up and down if the internal stresses force it to do so. The ice flows themselves can be of contrasting thicknesses and in the experiments we have tried different geometries and different settings. This is what a typical experiment looks like. You can see that they initially bend together, but at some point the elastic bonds begin to fail and the ridging actually starts to happen. So here we see that one ice flow is being uh, subducted beneath another ice flow. And here it's the thin ice flow that is pushed 
underneath the upper one. We also see that the ice bits form a chaotic rubble, which is known from the field in the case of ice ridging. As I said, we try out many different ratios of ice thicknesses, and I've just shown a few of them here. And you can see that um, the outcome is often chaotic, and we have a chaotic rubble of ice ridging happening. However, we can still analyze the bulk stresses from this deformation event and also repeat each setting to get an idea of the st statistic uncertainty of a given stress state. The general picture is that we have an initial state where the ice flows are still intact, but during early compression we get to what we call a pre-failure state. In this state we have elastic and reversible bending of the ice flows. Um, so in this case the ridging is not yet initiated, but the individual bonds are still intact and the bulk elastic response is quite significant. You can see that the internal stresses here are visualized with the colors on the bonds. So on the bottom of this ice flow we have a regime of high compression, whereas the top of this ice flow experiences high extension and tension. So the ice flow that is the thinnest typically experiences the highest compressive and tensile stresses. So it's the same one that is due to fail uh, in the early states. The next state is the post-failure state, where we have uh, some kind of elastic breakage or plastic breakage between some of these bonds and the ice flows rearrange into a chaotic rubble. Further compression means that the ice flows slide against each other and this would typically be happening uh, with elastic frictional Coulomb sliding contact mechanics. We can also assess the thickness distribution across some of these experiments and we can see that the thickness distribution follows this exponential decay with increasing thickness. And this exponential decay is known from measurements on the ice pack thickness of, for example, the Arctic sea ice. We can also analyze the bulk stresses. So this plot shows the compressive distance or in other words, the duration of the experiment. So early on the experiments, in the experiment, the ice flows haven't yet met then they meet and the elastic resistance gives rise to a rapid increase in compressive stress. Then bonds begin to break and the breakage means that all of this elastic stress is rapidly released and instead the grains start to slide against each other which much, with much weaker strength. The peak strength in the pre-failure state that was this peak up here, turns out to be dependent on the minimum thickness between two ice flows. So here on the horizontal axis, we have the smallest ice thickness of the participating ice flows. And the vertical axis shows the maximum compressive stress that we observe. And we see that it follows um, a a slightly nonlinear trend to a power of three halves. So if we um, make a fit to these strength measurements, we can see that it actually scales with something we call the fracture toughness. This is a concept known from other faulting um, geomechanics and the contact area. We also tried to simulate simpler geometries, such as compression of an elastic sheet. And the elastic sheet generally has the same strength as analytical buckling solutions for slender elastic objects sitting on an elastic half space. The different lines here 
um, represent different bending modes, so the number of wavelengths that are represented in the slender buckling. We can also see that the elasticity itself is more important than the plasticity, because if we compress two ice flows, then the contact interface between the two already acts as a potential failure plane. So we want to parameterize the observed behavior so we can use a ridging model in the larger scale sea ice models. We want to go from a simple pre-failure contact geometry to a post-failure contact geometry where the active ridging, ridging is happening. So in the initial case, the ice flows are floating side by side and have a horizontal or vertical contact interface. In the post-failure case, the ice flows are stacked and the mutual contact interface is a sub-horizontal sliding interface. We can come up with analytical expressions for these transitions. So, as we previously saw, the strength in the pre-failure state is limited by the fracture toughness and the minimum thickness of the participating um, ice flows. We also have this slight nonlinearity to the strength, and this strength limits the product of or the parallelogram of the normal force and the tangential force on the ice flow ice flow contact. As soon as the ridging is then initiated, because this criterion is succeeded, we go into the post failure sliding regime. And in this case, the sliding force on the contact interface is limited by Coulomb friction. We can then decompose the stresses on this contact interface into normal components and into tangential components. And the tangential components feed into the normal force and the tangential force also feeds into the tangential force. We then take this ridging parameterization into a larger scale model. So this is a plan view model where each individual ice particle represents an ice flow floating on the ocean surface. In this setting, the granular assemblage of ice flows is compressed here from one side, and we observe how the ridging is distributed within this ice pack. It turns out that the magnitude of the fracture toughness is fundamental in controlling the distribution of strain and in the bulk strength of the ice pack. The leftmost plot here shows a setting where we have a relatively low fracture toughness. In that case, you can see that the frictional losses are very low, so the ice particles are generally um, uh, whitish in color and many of the ice flow ice flow contacts are actively ridging and that is denoted here by the black lines. The white lines represent contacts which have not yet ridged. If we then increase the fracture toughness and that's the case here on the right we can see that much fewer um, contacts actually ridge and that makes sense, because if it's harder to ridge, then only the weakest members will actually begin to do so. In that case, we see that there is a high amount of strain localization and around these few ridging contacts. So with high fracture toughnesses, we see a high degree of strain localization and uh, discrete ridges forming. With a low um, fracture toughness, on the other hand, we see the ridging being much more distributed over the model domain. With regards to the bulk strength, the fracture toughness also plays a fundamental role. If the fracture toughness is very low, we see that the overall uh, sea ice assemblage also turns out to be very weak. On the other hand, if the fracture toughness is very high, then the overall strength is also high. 
Um, we can also see that the bulk strength is characterized by this stick-slip pattern, where the stress is built up and then a new ridging event happens, uh, which relieves some of the elastic strain that is built up. Then the elastic stress is built up again and there is a new drop uh, during a new ridging uh, event. So, to conclude, in this study we've used the discrete element method to simulate ice flow mechanics and in particular we've explored the role of breakable bonds and um, come up with some way of including ridging in discrete element sea ice models. We show that elasticity provides a large resistance during the early stages of ice compression, but as soon as ridging begins to happen, the contacts actually weaken quite dramatically. And this causes a strain weakening and a localization of strain. We do expect that any kind of refreezing will heal the assemblage in the post failure state by adding new cohesion and strength between this uh, chaotic rubble of ice flow pieces. So thank you for listening. I'm happy to share a preprint on uh, these results and also let me know if you have any question. I'm looking forward to the discussion during the actual workshop. See you!